Let's sing, oh precious. Oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh no, other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh no, other fount I know, nothing but the blood of talk about justice, which is a topic that obviously matters a whole lot to our world right now. Um, and it's also a topic that really, really matters to Jesus. And as we go into this next song, we are going to sing several times. It's pretty repetitive, but we're going to sing several times that God is good. You are good. You are good. You are good. You are good. And this is a truth that we have to hold on to. We have to. And as cliche and repetitive as it might sound, it is true and it's something that we can very easily forget. But God is the definition of good. He is the one that sets the standard and he is good all the time, period. 
So let's praise him in that way, worship him in that way, and look to him, especially now. Let's sing this.
Jesus, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much that you have uh, continued to sustain us, that you have continued to work even in ways that we cannot see. You are good. In a world that is desperately in need of justice or a sense of justice, we know that you are just, that you are holy, that you are righteous. Help us to look to you in the midst of all of this, in the midst of every circumstance we face, as the perfect and good standard of what goodness and rightness and justice looks like. So would you teach us this morning, speak to us, help us to lean into what you have for us and your plan for the world. So Jesus, we thank you and give you this morning. Amen. All right, check out this video and we'll continue on in a moment. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Okay, midsummer. Hey, i uh, glad you're here. For those of you who are here in the house, uh, for those of you who are in your own home or office uh, tuning in online, we are so glad that you continue to do so. We hope you feel at home, uh, even through a remote uh, presence. We hope you feel a part of the family, uh, whether you've chosen because you have to stay home or you uh, have made that choice outright. Uh, we are so glad uh, that you're a part of this and uh, still a part of Rock Creek Church uh, and our family. Do want to encourage you that if you are even in uh, thinking about coming, please uh, visit our website, www.rockcreekchurch.org forward slash attend, and we'd love to have you uh, join all these beautiful faces. Uh, before we get started, uh, we have more family news. Uh, it seems like a regular occurrence, so I'm going to invite the whole Schultz family who's present here. Come on up, Rachel, you too. Come on up. You can stand by your parents. Uh, give them a round of applause. We're going to make this short and sweet because uh, they are criers. It's up to you, man. All right. Scott's a break in the law kind of guy. Uh, but no, we, we love the Schultz. We're going to keep this short and sweet because Scott will start crying, then Laura will start crying, and then Rachel will start crying. I will start crying, and it'll just kind of like spread like wildfire. So um, uh, every now and then we have people enter into our lives, become integral part of our lives uh, personally uh, as friends, but also a part of our church. And we don't ever understand why God gives and takes away and how he plans timing. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that is the case uh, with Scott and Laura. They brought us uh, this dear couple about two years ago, uh, and they literally jumped right in, uh, mowing lawns, sweeping, mopping the floor, uh, running life groups, uh, being part of our prayer group, and the list goes on. Uh, and uh, today we say, what are we saying? So long, have a great vacation. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's going to be a long vacation, but nevertheless, they're moving uh, to Wisconsin. Uh, so, yay. <laughs> Okay, uh, now if I like Fiji or Hawaii, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that's so good for them. Yeah, they're moving to Wisconsin. So uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Scott has a new job there. Uh, they're going to be awfully close to grandbabies uh, and be able to enjoy that. Um, we want to be able to pray for you guys. This is, uh, I, I was going to say bittersweet. This is tr truly for me, this is bitter. Um, I'm going to miss the two of you so greatly, uh, your close family and friends with Sandy and I and our kids. We love you. We're so excited that you'll be back in a month for Rachel, who is getting married. Yay! See what happens when I don't say Wisconsin? Um, so anyway, uh, they, they will be back and hopefully attend uh, church on Sunday. We love you. We love you. We love you. We'll be praying for you. Uh, would you please stand with me and let's pray over this dear family as they get ready for their next journey. 
uh, in life. God, we just sang that song, You Are Good. (laughs) You are good, you are good, you are good. And I don't pretend to understand your ways on how you allow people to move around and uh, how you have jobs and houses and lives planned in, in different parts of the country and for such a time as this, but I personally count it uh, a privilege and an honor and a personal blessing to me and to this church that you would allow Scott and Laura to be a part of our family. So you are good. At all times, in all ways, you are good. So thank you. Thank you for this dear family and pray that you would give them uh, courage and strength and peace and hope as they go to their next chapter in Madison, Wisconsin. Pray that you would provide a home. Pray that you would provide friends. Pray that you would uh, provide an incredible Christ-proclaiming church that they could be a blessing to them as they were to us. And this is not goodbye. Um, They are lifelong friends, and uh, so this is have a great vacation. We'll see you soon. Uh, So thank you. Uh, We give you great praise and glory and honor for the creation that you made in Scott and Laura Schultz uh, and ask that you would guide them. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, man. All right, you guys. Super fun. All right. Today, we're starting a brand new series called Elementary. Uh, We just finished a a series on the book of 1 Peter. If you missed any of of 1 Peter, I implore you to jump on our website and uh, watch a few of those uh, worship services. They are uh, nothing short of divine planning on God's behalf for what we are dealing with. Uh, as a culture, specifically as a nation. Uh, it was a rich, rich time. We have a four-week series now on elementary, which I'll get to that in just a moment. At the conclusion of this series, we are starting a pretty lengthy study on the book of Ephesians. Uh, we are super excited for it. Uh, I want to encourage you uh, now begin to read the book of Ephesians underline things, star things, highlight things that maybe stand out to you that you want further understanding. Um, But we are going to take several weeks, like three months, uh, unpacking the book of Ephesians in depth, and it's going to be an incredible uh, time. Uh, But prior to that, we have four weeks where we're going to be looking at this new series called Elementary. And our goal behind this lays the burning question that many people are asking today, and that is, how do I live in such times as this? Where do I find hope? How how do I have encouragement? Where do I find peace? What do I say to uh, the either presumed injustices, real injustices, or fake injustices that are present in our world? How do I live with that? And, and there's a lot of people saying, this is hard. This is defeating. What do I do with what we've been dealt? And all of culture, both far from God and close to God, or are at least asking questions similar to this. Maybe not in the exact wording, but they're, they're inquiring a little bit further in, what do I do with this? And so we are readdressing some elementary teachings of the faith that give very strict guidance, very pointed guidance for the follower of Jesus on how to do just that. Now, don't misinterpret the word elementary as juvenile. Uh, we don't want to do that. We, we want to kind of redefine or, or stick closer to the dictionary definition of elementary, and that is, this is how the dictionary defines elementary, relating to the most important rudimentary, in other words, basic foundational aspects of subject. So it's not juvenile, it's actually the most important thing. If you're going to build a building, you start with the foundation. It, it never gets seen, it, it never gets talked about, but that is the most important part of 
whatever you are creating. So we're going to refresh our understanding of what it means to be called to be Christ followers in a culture, and then we're going to apply those realities that we unpack into our current realities of today, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So that's kind of where we're going for the next four weeks. Um, Injustice. Uh, This morning, we're going to talk about injustice. Uh, If you've uh, been outside of underneath a rock, you know that injustice is the primary discussion point short of COVID that we are facing today. Not just here in Colorado, not just in the United States, but all over the world. The idea of injustice, both present and past and future, is being talked about. So what we're going to do this morning is take a look at injustice from a theological understanding. Next week, we're going to unpack the Shema located in the book of De- Deuteronomy. It's a daily and morning uh, morning and evening kind of prayer, specifically uh, in, in Judaism, as an affirmation of God's singular kingship. And so we're going to unpack how does that affect how we're supposed to live today. Then we'll look at the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the often forgotten member of the Trinity. So we're going to tap into that and unpack that. And then we're going to wrap it all up by rebirthing the importance of the Sabbath. So there are going to be four heavy topics, but four very practical topics as we get back to some of this elementary teaching on how we are to live today. And hopefully give you all as parents uh, some guidance and some tools on how to help your kids re-enter into this way of living. Okay, are we ready? All right, get your Bibles open if you don't already. Uh, If you're at home and you're watching, go ahead and hit pause, run and grab your Bible, uh, bring it back. We're going to be kind of all over uh, the scriptures. Some of them are on the screen or on your TV set. Some of them won't be, so you're going to want to jot a note down and refer to that at a later time. So let's hit it. A Christian's view of injustice. Since Jesus Christ walked the earth, the thinking of the world concerning social matters, including social justice, has changed pretty radically. If you think about the days of Jesus walking the streets, walking the dirt roads, sitting on hillsides, talking about injustice, all all moving up to today where we're talking about Instagram and Facebook and other means of uh, social platforms to talk about these things, things have changed radically. But it's important to note that some things have changed radically for the good since Jesus. This is often something that's forgotten or not talked about. But because of Jesus, the world witnessed a new reverence for human life and learned something of the dignity and the value and the worth of an individual. It was Jesus' assertion. It was his planning. It was his teachings that every individual has immeasurable value and worth every person. It was Jesus who taught us that every person is a potential child of God, made in his image, wired for the things of God. Every human life wired for the things of God. When he lived on earth, no one was his teacher's pet because of uh, riches or poverty. Title or, or class or social distinction, they meant nothing to him. He saw man and woman as man and woman, and that's how he cared. That's our example. And because of Jesus, women were respected and valued. He changed the way the world, not just those around him, but the way the world viewed women. In fact, in much of ancient literature in Jesus' times, the idea of woman was on the same class as a dog. And Jesus changed that. As a result of the coming of Jesus, thousands of Christians throughout the ages have given their lives to help their neighbor, to relieve poverty, 
to care for the sick. Most hospitals, orphanages, institutions for the poor, asylums for those who struggle with mental health have their origin in followers of Jesus Christ. The social injustice consciousness that is broadening your horizon to even recognize that there's injustices out there started and received their momentum by the coming of Christ and those who followed him. A lot of good has happened in the eyes of social injustice. So why then is the world in such a desperate predicament? How did we find ourselves here? The answer, according to John chapter 5, it'll be on the screen, verses 39 and 40, is because the world has not returned to Jesus Christ that it might have life. The world has rejected him, and it continues to reject him. And injustice is a result of that. Now, what I'm hoping to do is to give you an idea of what is injustice, why do we have it, and what's the answer to injustice. You turn on your television today, and you will see a thousand different so-called news anchors giving you guidance on how we can fix injustice, where injustice is rooted, how it started. I want to give you the true answer to that. Now, you might not like it. You might not even agree with it, but I can promise you it is the truth according to the scriptures. Now, throughout this series, uh, each of us that are going to be preaching this, we're going to be using several different video clips to help kind of strengthen what we're saying. Also to help you all as families uh, back at home or, or here in the room, that if you have kids, that this is something that is going to be applicable to them, that they can understand these significant theological themes through these various video clips. So really encourage you to grab your kids, huddle them around, and then you can easily just hit pause. You don't even have to listen to me the rest of the time. Hit pause after the video clip and have a family conversation that is equally as important. So take a look at this first clip as we dive deeper into injustice. If you were a praying mantis, it would be socially acceptable to devour your mate. And if you're a honey badger, you have no regard for other animals. You don't care. If you're a panda with twins, it's normal to abandon one to take care of the other. But if humans do any of these things, we would call it wrong, unfair, or unjust. Yeah, why is that? Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that, but we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And so in the biblical story, we see this happening on a personal level, but also in families and then in communities and in whole civilizations that create injustice, especially towards the vulnerable. We redefine good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. That's a powerful quote. I'll read it again if you want to take the note. We redefine good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. For most, this is just rooted in comfort. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We want to live our lives. We want to believe what we believe. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want extra work. We don't want to have to think differently. We're right, and we don't want to be told otherwise. But if we're going to touch the life of injustice in our communities, and it must start with the church, we must know their sorrows, their trials, 
their temptations, and we must stand with them in their heartbreaks. And we've seen this. Jesus modeled this for us. He entered into the fray of our troubles. He entered into this world on purpose. He wept with those who wept. He rejoiced with those who rejoiced. He sat with those farthest from God. Not those who came to our Bible study. He sat with the most disgusting of individuals. Why? To love. To change things. To listen. Anyone who cares enough to want to help people must eventually sit where they sit. Not watch them sit there, but go and sit with them. There's a but. Or I should say, uh, however, we must remember that they, those who are or have experienced injustice, they're still people. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you watching online. You're still a person. And that means as people, we, they, you are sinners before God. This is super important for us to understand when we think about injustice and when we think about what are we supposed to do with injustice. Why is this important? It's important because we must not make the mistake of blaming all of their troubles on an impersonal, sinful society that has done them wrong. This is critical. Because that's what the news says today. Anyone who has experienced injustice has received injustice at the hand of another, and therefore that other is guilty. And it makes them terrible. Okay, pause for a moment. Hear me when I say this. I'm going to say it abundantly clear. In many cases, it has and continues. Society, individuals, have indeed brought about unspeakable injustices to one another. Is that clear? Absolutely present. But it's not the total problem. As Christ followers, as those who want to understand theologically God's design for creation and what we're dealing with today, this is absolutely critical for our understanding, especially for those of you who are in junior high and high school and college, to enter into these conversations of injustice. Yes, there's an aspect of the injustice that is other people focused. Yes, incredible injustices have been done because of society to individuals. 100% yes, but that's not the total package. Yes, injustices need to be righted, but that's not the whole problem. The foundational problem of injustice was pointed out by Jesus when he said this, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Green Bay Packer fans. Like, Jesus made sure he covered all those evil things. All of these evil things, the Bible says, Jesus says, comes from within. And what do they do? They defile a man. Here's the problem and the root of injustice. Jesus indicated that our problem in regards to justice and injustice is a heart trouble just like the video stated. And that's a problem for this world. That's a problem for you and I outside of Jesus Christ. 
Let's keep watching. Here's video number two. But the story doesn't end there. Out of this whole mess, God chose a man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was to teach his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Yeah, doing righteousness, that's a Bible word I don't really use, but what comes to mind is being a good person. But what does that even mean, being good? The biblical Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, and it's more specific. It's an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It's about treating others as the image of God. With the God-given dignity they deserve. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. Like here in the book of Proverbs, what does it mean to bring about just righteousness? Open your mouth for those who can't speak for themselves. And what do these words mean for the prophets like Jeremiah? Rescue the disadvantaged and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And like here, look in the book of Psalms. The Lord God upholds justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and sets the prisoner free. But he thwarts the way of the wicked. Whoa, he thwarts the wicked? Yeah, in Hebrew, the word wicked is rasha. It means guilty or in the wrong. It refers to someone who mistreats another human, ignoring their dignity as an image of God. So justice and righteousness is a big deal to God. Yes, it's what Abraham's family, the Israelites, were to be all about. They ended up as immigrant slaves, being oppressed unjustly in Egypt. And so God confronted Egypt's evil, declaring them to be rasha, guilty of injustice. And so he rescued Israel. But the tragic irony of the Old Testament story is that these redeemed people went on to commit the same acts of injustice against the vulnerable. And so God sent prophets who declared Israel guilty. But they weren't the only ones. There's injustice everywhere. Yeah, some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others receive benefits or privileges from unjust social structures they take for granted. And sadly, history has shown that when the oppressed gain power, they often become oppressors themselves. I love the way that the video unpacks injustice. Just helps us understand it just a little bit more. It's a human heart issue. For every single person that has ever walked or will ever walk this planet. And it wasn't just Jesus who addressed it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, stood in the heart of pagan, secular, racist, immoral, violent Corinth. That's what Corinth was. And he said this, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, or the Gentiles, if you would, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. According to Paul, and it still is the fact today, the proclamation of the gospel is still the desperate need of every man and woman today. Nothing has changed. And listen, I believe, this is just my two cents, but I believe we are never, ever, ever going to reverse the trends of injustice without a spiritual awakening. It is never going to happen, and we are never going to have a spiritual awakening until the cross of Jesus Christ and His ultimate justice is central to our everyday living. It is not going to happen. James Stewart, professor of New College in Edinburgh, said this, the driving force of the early Christian mission was not propaganda of beautiful ideals of the brotherhood of man. It was the proclamation of the mighty acts of God. 
At the heart of the apostles' message stood the divine redemptive deed on Calvary, and there is the epicenter of injustice made right. The problem is we're not willing to go there. Even the church isn't willing to go there. You see, if culture wants high moral standards in our nation and a new social justice reform, then the church must return to living and preaching the simple, authoritative gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that means not preaching me, that means us preaching in our everyday lives, campfires, playing cards over a glass of wine, going for a hike, hanging out together, talking, living out the gospel to one another. Not laws, not reforms, not social actions, not protests, not rioting, but Jesus Christ. Why? Why not all those other things? Why are they not the solution? They're not the solution because every other effort is going to fade away and in time be blanketed by human sin all over again. Spinning our wheels looking for hope. When hope is being offered every day, every minute, through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then and only then will injustice be made right. The message of Jesus and God's design to confront injustice, to be made right by His justice, will withstand eternity. It won't be dampered, it won't won't fade away, it won't be thinned out. It's the gospel. It's our only hope. For it was the gospel that brought about so many great social reforms over the past. The preaching of the cross and the resurrection have been primarily responsible for promoting humanitarian responses and social concern over the past 400 years. Without the Christian response, we would be even worse than we are today. Prison reform, the prohibition of slave trade, the abolition of slavery, improvement in working conditions, the protection of children, the voice for the unborn, The crusade against cruelty to animals are the outcomes of great religious awakenings throughout this planet. And they were brought about by the proclamation of the gospel. There's power in this book. There's power in the truths, in the stories, in the promises, and in the end. Of this book. And who has been at the forefront of every single one of those spiritual awakenings? Who has been at the forefront and and front and center of every single one of those social reforms throughout the last 400 years? And even prior to that, Jesus Christ. Without turning to Him, we have no hope to ultimately confront injustice. Watch this last video. So we all participate in injustice, actively or passively, even unintentionally. We're all the guilty ones. And so this is the surprising message of the biblical story. God's response to humanity's legacy of injustice is to give us a gift, the life of Jesus. He did righteousness and justice, and yet he died on behalf of the guilty. But then God declared Jesus to be the righteous one when he rose from the dead. And so now Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that they too can be declared righteous before God, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus did for them. 
The earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness from God, not just as a new status, but as a power that changed their lives and compelled them to act in surprising new ways. Yeah, if God declared someone righteous when they didn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. This is a radical way of life, and it's not always convenient or easy. It's courageously making other people's problems my problems. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There is no doubt that today we see social injustice everywhere. And it is sad. However, Jesus, if he were to look and analyze what we're dealing with today and to give us some insight, he would see something deeper than just the injustice that's available to the eyes. If only we would begin at the root of our problems, which is the disease of human nature that the Bible calls sin. It's the root of injustice. This is why Christ came and died on the cross. This is why he shed his blood to do something about this cancerous tumor that mankind is suffering from. And and instead of going to the treatment that's been Uh, prescribed to us to deal with that ailment, we're looking for every other means to do it. We're grasping at straws, if you would, hoping something will help. The late Billy Graham said this, we in the church today, we're in danger of becoming blundering social physicians, not Stan, Uh, giving medicine here and putting ointment there on the sores of the world, but the sores break out again somewhere else. The great need is for the church to call in the great physician who alone can properly diagnose the case. He will look beneath the mere skin eruptions and pronounce the cause of it all, sin. Man, Billy Graham. Listen, the Bible has a lot to say on injustice. We know that God is in favor of justice. We know that He is against injustice, even in the most basic forms. The writer of the Proverbs mentions this, the Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please Him. The book of Leviticus tells us that injustice is foundational to God's throne. And God does not approve of partiality, whether we're talking about a weighted scale or an unjust legal system. Isaiah lived in a time when Judah was struggling under the weight of injustice. See if this sounds familiar to you today. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14 and 15. Justice is driven back and righteousness stands off at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter into the equation. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes pray. The Lord looked and he was displeased that there was no justice. And what does God say to them in the midst of this reality that they are living in? Here's what he says. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause for the fatherless. Plead the case for the widow. I love what the video said. It's taking other people's problems and making them your own. And I wonder over the last five months, how often have you taken, have you been able to take the injustice felt real time by others and made that your problem? Because here's what I'm tired of hearing. Allow me a soapbox moment. 
I am so sick and tired of Christians saying, not my problem, they need to get over it, how often do we have to apologize, et cetera, et cetera. You are living in sin if you have that mindset. You need to get over yourself. Because that kind of thinking has no place in the scriptures. Ever. There's not a single page that utters any of those words. But rather the pages are filled with taking up the cause for another and making it your own. And most notably, Jesus. He took up our troubles. They weren't his. But he decided to go, man, their problems are so severe. That injustice, where they're headed to hell and damnation, I'm going to take that on myself as my trouble. And that's the example for us. This theological view of injustice is absolute critical for today's living. Why? Because it helps us filter the media. It helps us filter what we hear in the news. It helps us filter what we hear from friends and family and neighbors and coworkers. It's a screen that allows us to see the world the way Jesus sees it. And it even keeps us in check to our own ideological worldviews. Why is that important? Because you can't trust you. I hope you know that. When you think something, when you feel something, I hope you realize I can't necessarily trust this. I got to measure that up against the scripture. I got to talk to other people. I got to measure that up against doctrine and theology because I don't know if I'm right. I hope that's in your thinking. And if it's not, please, I beg you to begin to enter into that practice. According to the book of 1 John, it's short, you can read it while going to the bathroom. The only way to truly escape injustice is to first accept that God is perfectly just and that humans are completely unjust. That is, less than perfect, and then to accept God's righteousness. Romans chapter 4 tells us that only when we are no longer justifying our thinking and our actions can we trust the one who justifies the ungodly. And then as God's children, we can clearly see to combat the injustices around us with the attitude of Christ Jesus. But we can't do it without Jesus. That's why we pray for our governors and our mayors and our city leaders and our president and his cabinet because they can't fix injustice without Jesus Christ. Jesus is totally just. There is no injustice in him at all. And because of his perfection, Jesus can provide true, long-lasting justice. Let me give you two last verses. John chapter 5, verse 22 says, The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. As Christ followers, we look forward to the day when there's absolute, ultimate justice. It will not happen this side of heaven. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7 says, Of the greatest of his government and peace, there will be no end. Imagine no end of peace. I can't even imagine there being peace, let alone no end to it. It says there will be no end to the peace. He, Jesus, will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice. And righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. So may we, repeat, may we repeatedly return to Jesus Christ. May our country turn to God. May our culture turn its eyes to Christ. For there and only there will they find justice that it longs for. Let's pray. God, we 
recognize that our culture we're uh, searching for peace uh, we're searching for justice we're searching for making everything right and we're thinking which candidate can do it which law can do it which reform can do it uh, which protest can ultimately create change? Which uh, form of rioting is acceptable to create change? If we kneel, if we stand, if we wear something, if we say something, if we post something, that maybe somehow it'll create change. It, it'll, it'll change the dynamics of our world. Lord, we are searching. And for those of us who know you, for those of us who have accepted the cross, who have accepted your lordship, we know the answer is like a neon sign driving through Vegas. It is so blatantly obvious to those of us who kneel before the cross that it is only for Jesus Christ. We pray that our world would have the scales fall from their eyes and to see you as the ultimate only hope. And that we as Christ followers would enter into these discussions with wisdom and insight, with your heart. That we would sit where other people sit. That we would take on their problems as our problems and be a part of the solution. In other words, be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to a very hurting and searching world. Elementary teachings of the Scripture but so powerful and practical for us today. Please give us the courage and the strength to apply those things and at every turn to give you the glory and the honor and the praise and reflect others to you. That is our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand? All starts with Jesus. All justice is about coming alongside God and his plan for the world. So if it starts with him, let's praise him in this time now. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. Praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord.
just with our words, but with our hearts. with Jesus. We're going to sing one more song called Oh Come to the Altar, and it's one we've sung here many times before, but I want to give the opportunity as we sing this song, if, if you are at a point, maybe you've been coming or tuning in for weeks, for longer than that, maybe you're wrestling with your faith, but if you are at a point where you have not actually given your life to Jesus, that is the first step is our own individual justice because when we give our life to Christ, when we put our faith in him, he makes us right. It's a spiritual truth. Even though we, in our, in our cells right now, in our own bodies, we're not perfect, God makes us just. We stand in good standing before him. So as we sing the song, I want to encourage you, if you've never made that decision to, to, to pray, to come to God and say, I'm sorry, Please forgive me of my sins. Take my life, I am yours. Whatever that looks like, put it in your own words. If you want help, reach out to someone on the live chat. If you're online or if you're in this room, seek out a pastor or someone else to speak to, but please make that step. Jesus wants you to come home and he wants to make you whole and makes you right. He wants to redeem you and bring you out of that. But for all of us collectively, let's come to the, the so-called altar before God, before God our Father, and receive what he has for us. Receive the love, receive the forgiveness, receive that redemption that he longs to, to implement and put into our lives more and more every day. So let's sing.
church or I don't know, if you don't quite consider this your home church yet you know whoever you are you as individuals may you know God's love for you Jesus's heart for you what he has done for you on the cross that he has ultimately accomplished your forgiveness your righteousness your holiness completely already on the cross so go knowing that please pursue him run after him seek an idea of justice, the concept of justice in him first, and let that inform the way that you interact with the world around you. But I hope that this was an encouragement to you, that you feel closer to God than you did before you walked in, this, in these doors, and uh, we encourage you along the way. So we're grateful for you. Go in peace. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Oh